South Florida, the epicenter of COVID-19. Sadly, we're number one. We go out and we see people are not wearing masks, they're getting together, and it's the problem. Florida is in the red zone, according to the White House. Numbers climb, hospital beds and staffing stretched. We have already sent additional health care personnel down to Miami-Dade County. New curfews and closures from the beaches to the Keys. Social gatherings, including house parties, street parties, and other activities that are contributing to the community spread of the virus. I mean, the police department continues to have the authority to go the criminal route. Day one of civil fines. Business violators ordered shut. We have to create a greater sense of urgency. Stopping the spread, now a focus for Miami-Dade mayoral candidates. Steve Bobo is with us. I'm the only conservative that's running for office. All this week, this week in South Florida. Good morning, I'm Michael Putney. Glad to be back with you after shoulder surgery. Bionic Newsman is back. Great <laughs> to have you back. I'm Glenna Milberg. The daily COVID numbers still climbing with predictions now that South Florida is still three weeks away from the peak. The reason for major changes this week meant to stop the spread. Those making those changes are with us today. And we are going to begin with Parker Branton, who is live at Hard Rock Stadium at the testing site, which Governor DeSantis specifically mentioned in his weekend briefing. Parker, what's the latest out there? Michael, good morning. Another day of testing underway here at Hard Rock Stadium. Governor DeSantis says that most of the people that are lining up here to get tested at Hard Rock are actually asymptomatic. Governor Ron DeSantis saying Tuesday that the high number of tests being run every day puts those numbers in context. Testing 100,000 people a day and the majority of the positive tests are people who are either asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. That's something that's important for people to know. DeSantis says the state examined testing data from different sites around the state, including the drive through at Hard Rock Stadium, and found that 80% of those tested said they're asymptomatic. That's a huge number of people that are testing uh, who have not developed symptoms and have not displayed any illness. The governor also encouraging those who have recovered from COVID-19 to donate their blood to help provide potentially life-saving plasma treatments. If you are positive for antibodies, if you have cleared uh, the illness, uh, please, consider to don please consider donating the blood. DeSantis announcing that 30,000 vials of remdesivir are arriving Sunday. The drug has been shown to improve outcomes for some coronavirus patients. The supply can treat roughly 5,000 hospitalized COVID patients. We want to make sure that the physicians have what they need. The peak of COVID cases in South Florida is expected in three weeks. We're live at Hard Rock Stadium. I'm Parker Branton. Glenn and Michael, back to you. Parker, thanks so much. As Florida numbers rose this week and the positivity rate remained in the red zone, South Florida's Democratic members of Congress implored Governor DeSantis to issue a statewide mask order as well as more targeted stay-at-home orders. And one of the congressmen signing that letter is Representative Ted Deutsch, a Democrat from Boca Raton, represents the 22nd Congressional District, Northern Broward, Southern Palm Beach counties. He's joining us. We see him there by Skype. Congressman, good morning. Great to have you on the show. Uh, well, it's great to be with you both. And um, Michael, I'm glad that you're back and doing better. Well, thank you so much. I'm fully recovering. Uh, Congressman, uh, you and the other Democratic members of Congress from South Florida, you know, really blasted the governor for his handling of the coronavirus crisis, COVID-19. What is your principal criticism? Well, the, the principal criticism is that we continue to see the number of cases increase dramatically, the number of hospitalizations increase dramatically, and the number of deaths increase dramatically um, week after week. And yet the governor continues to try to change the subject, to downplay the severity, to, to make us think that what we're seeing every day is actually different than what it is. Yesterday, when the governor suggested um, in the most offensive way to the people of Florida that we can't tell the difference between the number of cases and the number of people being hospitalized and, and perhaps we're getting them confused, um, it's the governor's confusion, it's his failure to lead, to put in place the kinds of steps that are necessary right now that can help bring down the number of cases 
and bring down the hospitalizations, give our frontline workers a chance at this thing and to save lives. That's all we want to do. That's all anyone wants to do is to let the public health experts tell us how we can work together to save the lives of Floridians. All right, so Congressman, you and, and a lot of other people are asking the governor for a statewide stay-at-home order. From the beginning, the governor has said that he's leaving that to the locals because in fairness, this pandemic looks very different in South Florida than it does in different parts of more rural Florida. And in fact, our local leaders have instituted mask orders and closures that we're out every day and we see people violating even with them in place. So how do you envision a statewide mask order being enforced when, when people are obviously not following them, those that are already in place? Um, right. Well, I, I'm reminded of the, uh, the quote I saw from Mayor Suarez, who had it just right, that people follow the people who are, I think he said, who are supposed to be leaders. And, and that's what we need from the governor. I understand that it's a big state. I understand that there are, that there are different challenges in different parts. And, and we've urged the governor to work with the public health officials to tailor the response in, in the different parts of the state. But right now, when everyone from the public health experts, the doctors, the hospitals, the CDC, everyone tells us, even the administration now acknowledges that wearing masks is the best thing that we can do to help prevent a, another big shutdown, uh, to help save lives and to help give, give these doctors and nurses a chance. When that's the one thing that we know will work, then let's do it. I don't understand. I really don't understand why it's so hard to to simply require that people do something that can help save lives. Yeah. Because without using that same kind of logic, we we wouldn't have seatbelt laws because different parts of the state are different. People ride differently. We wouldn't have a whole host of laws that are in place to keep us safe. Masks can help stop the spread. If we stop the spread, we're in a better position to save lives and to help us get through this. Yeah. Congressman, uh, what about the cause and effect thing here? We have President Trump who says, yeah, all right, masks are all right under certain circumstances, but he really doesn't wear one, wore one once at Walter Reed Medical Center. Uh, and of course, Governor DeSantis is his disciple. Uh, Trump is his mentor. Uh, the president doesn't really like to wear a mask. Uh, the governor will on occasion wear one, but he says one size doesn't fit all when it comes to wearing a mask in Florida. What do you think? Um, I don't, I don't, I can't believe they were, I, quite frankly, I can't believe they were having a debate about wearing masks. That, that's what I think. I can't believe that when hospitals are filling up uh, they're putting beds into conference rooms because they're out of space otherwise, that when uh, hundreds of people are dying in our state, that we're having a discussion about whether the president thinks it's okay to wear a mask. And since the governor is his disciple, maybe he should follow along. I don't, Michael, I don't care about any of that. And the governor shouldn't either. Everyone who's watching your program knows that the governor's top priority should be keeping the people of this state safe. He doesn't, he, he doesn't work for the president. He works for the people of Florida. That's where he should be focused. Yeah. And that focus should tell him that we ought to be doing everything we damn well can to help stop this thing from getting worse and to help save the lives of our friends and our neighbors and our relatives because yeah. too many of us have seen people close to us get sick. We've yeah. seen it just this past week. Yeah. Congressman, let me follow up here. To give the governor his due, he and his staff took great care looking at long-term care facilities, ALFs, nursing homes. They sent in crews to, you know, National Guard uh, people to go in and test the staff and the residents there. And as bad as it has been, the death toll among elderly people in the state, the governor says it might have been worse, and I suspect he's right. Uh, th there, Michael, there'll be plenty of time for us to go back and do a full assessment. I have, I have given the governor credit where it's due um, as we've gone through this, even if it sometimes took too long for him to get to the place that he needed to be. But this isn't, this isn't about politics. I don't want to have a conversation about, uh, if, about what could have been worse 
in uh, in nursing homes any more than I want to have the conversation about uh, all of the things that the president of the United States and then governor could have done to save thousands of lives. Uh, there'll be plenty of time for that. Right now, I want to make sure that this isn't being driven, this whole process isn't being driven by me and by the governor and by the president, it, that it's being driven by the public health experts. And when you talk to the doctors and you talk to the hospitals and you talk to the epidemiologists, they will tell you it's time to stop looking for credit or blame and it's time to take action to save lives. That's got to be the priority. Congressman, I want to go back to something you just referenced that you also talked about when you were on a Zoom press conference on Friday with some of your colleagues in the House. You talked about how you have been talking to some doctors, uh, people on the front line, some nurses, and you've been hearing really concerning things about the lack of protective equipment. Uh, you mentioned they were some hospitals are putting beds in the garage because of this capacity. And, and I will tell you, we heard something that I took to be far different from the CEO of our public hospital in Miami-Dade, uh, Carlos Magoya this week, wh while sounding the alarm, did say that they are managing the census, that they have plenty of PPE staffing, he said, was their issue. So it, I, this, this seems to be sort of a, a more serious in spots in more spots than others. Right. That's that's absolutely true. And staffing is a problem. He, I'm glad he acknowledged it. That staffing is a problem in Broward. We've heard the same things. Uh, and when and when uh, sta you have short staff and you need to bring in nurses uh, and respiratory therapists from other places, you have to train them. That takes time. It costs money. You also, as the number of cases increases, you you put more nurses at risk of getting sick. And when they when they have to then quarantine, you have to bring in even more people. So uh, instead of constantly focusing on uh, on whether right now we have a sufficient number of hospital beds or we're making do, that's the the message. Every hospital will tell you they're making do because they have to. That's the that's their that's their job, and I give them incredible. Um, credit for being able to, to, to do what they're doing with their doctors and nurses and everyone else who works there. But we ought to be working together to help them. We help them by wearing masks to stop the spread. We help them by having a sound policy that goes out and cracks down on, on places that are violating the rules. We help them when we're looking for, for all of the ways that we can stop the spread. That's, got, that, that's what we ought to be doing together. That's going to ultimately help the hospitals. I don't want to get to the point where the hospitals are saying we are completely out of ICU beds, we are completely out of beds. I don't want it to look like the scenes from Italy with, with right. patients in the hallways, and I don't want it to look like New York. But I don't want to wait until that happens. I think we need to take action now. That's Again, that's what we want from the governor, and he ought to be able to do it. And he ought to be, bring the public health officials front and, and put them in front to lead this discussion because all of the public health officials I talk to tell us that the time has come to take drastic action to get this thing under control. Yeah. Congressman, hold your thoughts. Stay right there. We will be back with more with Representative Ted Deutsch in just a minute. We are glad you are with us on this Sunday on This Week in South Florida. We are speaking with Congressman Ted Deutsch, Democrat from Boca Raton. Uh, Congressman, you've probably seen the front page of the New York Times. The lead story today is how the White House in mid-April, with the president's direction, you know, decided to shift responsibility for fighting COVID-19 from the federal government to the states. And at the same time, they assumed that it was going down. Of course, it was not going down. It began to ramp up. And today, I think we're seeing the effects, the results of that in a poll. The Washington Post, uh, ABC News poll, shows that uh, Vice President Biden is at 55 percent. President Trump is at 40 percent. And in Florida, Biden is up by six points. So uh, the decision, first of all, to leave it up to the states, kind of a, uh, a behavioral sink, everybody, social Darwinism, every state up for themselves. Uh, that was not uh, a decision that in the end, the people of America, the people of Florida wanted. No, this was the, the single greatest 
opportunity, frankly. It, 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 yeah, you hate to think about it in these terms, but this was an opportunity for the president to display true leadership. The, cri the crisis that the country faced uh, was so severe, it cried out for national leadership, and the, and the president failed. There's just, there's no other way to look at it. That article this morning was stunning. The way that the president attempted to shift blame to try to create an opportunity for him to defend himself against any charges that would come, even as uh, we now face these dr dramatic increases in cases and in hospitalizations and in deaths. But Michael, you don't need to go back to April. You only have to look at where we've been for the past month, where the House of Representatives passed legislation to help struggling Americans, especially here in Florida, where you still have over a million Floridians out of work, who are going to see the end of their unemployment benefits right. if the Senate doesn't act. Uh, we extended those benefits. We extended the additional federal supplement. We provided additional payments to help people who are really struggling. And there's been silence from the Senate. And the president, once again, as has been the case throughout this entire pandemic, has failed to step up on behalf of the American people. He's failed to help address the health crisis. And right now, by refusing to go forward with the HEROES Act, he's failing again to address the economic crisis. That's a, a really dangerous one-two punch. Uh, it's too much for the American people to endure. Congressman, I'm sure you're hearing from your constituents uh, who are expecting, needing, increasingly desperate for unemployment relief. Right. The uh, Department of Economic Opportunity statewide puts out daily their status uh, as of Saturday. Um, that office said it paid out almost 11 billion in claims to 1.7 million claimants in the state. And yet I'm, we hear that I know you hear from people still trying to get money and, and finding roadblocks on the site. What can you tell us about that? Well, I, I can tell you that um, there is there is nothing uh, more painful than to have conversations, which we have literally every day, it's still from people who, who call and tell us they've never they've never been in a crisis like this. They've always been able to support themselves and their family. They've always been able to pay their bills. But because of this pandemic and the economic damage that it's wrought, they're they're out of money. They they can't get by anymore. They're fit. They they're out of food. It the stories are so painful, and uh, and yet here we are still struggling with an unemployment system that's been a total failure. It's not a question of how much money it was that was paid out. It's it's all of the people who spent hours and hours and days on the phone waiting for help, calling our office, calling the other their other elected officials, begging for a system that could actually respond to their needs, and it couldn't. And there is, uh, and we saw excuse after excuse coming from the governor, ultimately blaming unemployed Floridians themselves for, for not knowing how to fill out forms. Um, I, I wish that he would take some of the, the calls that, that we get and understand how dire this economic situation is and now we're just a week away from it getting even worse when the federal benefits stop. Where where is Marco Rubio and where where is Rick Scott right now when Floridians who are desperate, desperate, are about to see things get dramatically worse if the Senate doesn't act and they're playing politics with this? I don't understand that it's not fair and it certainly isn't right. Yeah. Uh, Congressman, let me ask you a couple of quick political questions, as you well know. August 17th, the Democratic National Convention, the new slimmed down virtual convention is going to take place in Milwaukee. Maybe they say 500 people will be there. You're certainly, you know, uh, one of the people who could attend. Are you going to actually go to Milwaukee? Well, I think right now the plan uh, from the last conversation I had with uh, the party officials uh, was to, to put on a um, uh, a, a big souped up online um, convention that will be accessible to everyone in America, uh, that will give everyone the opportunity to hear uh, the vision that Joe Biden has to lead our country back to a place of 
prominence in the world and a, a, a administration that will once again show respect and kindness and empathy and, and be willing to work every day on behalf of the American people instead of solely on behalf of the president. I think everyone's going to get to see that. It's, you're right. It's not going to be in person. And I don't, uh, I don't think that I'm going to be there in person either, but certainly look forward to playing whatever role I can in this, this big online effort that, that's going to be broadcast as well. People will see clearly uh, the vision that Joe Biden has for America, and I think they'll especially come to understand um, how different the visions are between the one I just described and one that is focused solely on protect on President Trump's protecting himself, protecting his family, looking out for ways to avoid blame instead of looking out for ways to help the American people. Congressman, you, I know that you have become an online expert, really enjoying your <laughs> Facebook posts every single <laughs> weeknight. So thanks so much for being with us. Good to see you. Thanks, Congressman. My pleasure. Thanks Appreciate so much. It. You do. It's good to be with you. And up next, a new focus on enforcing mask and social distancing orders. And for violators, it can get expensive. The Miami-Dade police are now enforcing these laws. So how are they doing? We are going to ask Police Director Freddie Ramirez. This week, Miami-Dade County took some significant steps to enforce regulations on wearing masks and social distancing. What they did was they said, we're going to issue civil citations, a ticket, for people who violate these regs. And those come with $100 fines for individuals and police officers issued dozens and also closed a number of businesses in just the first 24 hours that it was in effect. Police Department Director Freddie Ramirez joins us today from headquarters in Doral. Great to be with you again, Director. Thanks for being with us. Good morning, Glenn. Good morning, Michael. Hey, how you Freddie, all doing? We're, we're so glad you're with us. So how is the enforcement effort going on these COVID-19 regulations? First and foremost, I'm extremely proud of the men and women of the Miami-Dade Police Department that in the face of this pandemic, and everything that's going on, they're out there each and every day putting their lives on the line, trying to keep this community safe, be it uh, gun violence or a virus, this riddle of a virus. Um, you know, I hate to brag about this stats because this is not bragging. This is unfortunate that I have to say that we've issued about 115 violations, citations, since we started a civil citation process. And uh, we've closed uh, numerous businesses. And it's unfortunate because at the end of the day, the goal here is that we don't go backwards. Because if we end up going backwards, that burden is going to fall on the men and women of this police department who are, to, who are going to have to be out there to ensure that we keep everyone safe and keep them from spreading this virus and becoming out of control. And frankly, it takes all of us, law enforcement, the community, to get through this. And I'm extremely proud of our county directors who are all stepped up to this. Our ER, our fire department our uh, animal services, my, my school crossing guards who are out there on the parks, the Marine Patrol. It's like putting a finger in a dam that keeps leaking. So you I, go I think, after, uh, Director, yes. if I could, I don't mean to interrupt, but I think you just started to answer what I would love to hear was my next question is, up, up until Friday, this was a criminal charge only. And now that it's a civil violation, it sounds like many more people in the county have jurisdiction in issuing these tickets. Is, mm -hmm. is that's what that's what's making it easier and more more plentiful? Yes, it makes us a lot more nimble in enforcing because the, the, old, the only version we had before was a criminal aspect. And the last thing we want to do is criminalize people's lives. We don't want to do that. What we want is compliance. And by issuing the citations, we can be more nimble, more strategic. My city partners, the local chiefs, uh, uh, Miami Beach, City of Miami, uh, the day chiefs, they're part of this. They have their own versions of civil citations. And the ones that don't, they're getting on board with the MOU. Uh, you know, set, set by Commissioner uh, uh, Sally Heyman, who was really a pioneer with the civil citation process here in Miami-Dade County, right. and we're using it. Yeah. Uh, Director, when your officers and these other code enforcers go in, if you see a business, for example, that is, you know, staying open a restaurant later than it's supposed to, breaking the curfew, I'm, I'm, I'm said standard to go in and say, hey, you know, you are in violation you close down right away, uh, we'll kind of let it slide this time, or how aggressively are you enforcing? In the beginning, we were, we were using a balanced approach. We were trying to provide education, but now, be it the numbers that you're seeing in, in this community with the, with the spreading of the virus, 
uh, unfortunately, there is no more warnings. Now we have to go and, and really for the best interests of this community is to be much more stern with it. And yes, when we see the violations, we will close the business. And unfortunately, we will have to issue the citation. We'll deal with the management. And we don't want to see that. We don't want to hurt the business community. They're very important. We don't want to hurt anybody. But unfortunately, we're dealing with something that's bigger than all of us. And that's keeping this community safe from this virus. You know, just in a sort of a snapshot of how plentiful people are out there without social distancing, without masks, we took literally less than an hour the other day to come up with little clips of video of transit workers, construction workers, an indoor store clerk, a group of shoppers who are not social distanced, who are not wearing their masks. Certainly the intention is not to shame anybody, but just a snapshot of what you and the officers and code enforcement officers are facing. Give us a sense, Director, when, when an officer goes up to someone like that and says, a hundred dollar fine right now what is that like what's the next step what's the reaction how is that practically working well we use our community policing skills as you know the miami-dade police department practices proper community police practices and we use that like we would deal with any other situation we tell them it's for their own good you know we're not trying to harm them but we try to paint a picture of look with your actions of what you're doing affects the person next to you affects our elderly population affects the people in your own household and we issue them that citation with the hopes that they do not reoffend. And we can't be everywhere as law enforcement. You know, there's 2.7 million people in Miami-Dade County. I have 200 officers doing this plus 60 plus of RER. We can't be anywhere, everywhere. That's why it takes all of us together to be responsible, to tap each other in the shoulder and say, hey, put your mask on or keep your distance so we can get through this. If not, we're going to go backwards. Have you had any issues on the staff? Do you, I'm, I'm guessing, just like every other agency, you have uh, men and women who are COVID victims who are now uh, taking time off, yeah. maybe some staffing issues. Has, has that been an issue? Absolutely, and that's what hurts me the most. You know, right now I have about 132 total employees that are positive. You know, uh, roughly about 115 are officers, sworn officers, 28 or so are civilian personnel. And now that virus has entered the household, where before it was more about the contact in the street in the first version of this. Now the challenge is that virus is coming into the household because whoever your family member is near that is not being responsible, brings that into the home, not affects the officer. And it's just a rolling cycle. That's the that's what we're getting to right now. Unfortunately, most of them don't have symptoms. Some have minor symptoms. I have one that's in the hospital for oxygen treatment, and I talk to each one of them when they get when I get the notification. I call them to tell them, "Don't worry about the job. Worry about you. Worry about your family. Get healthy." Yeah. All right, Director Freddie Ramirez. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for sharing some of your Sunday and with us and with South Florida. We wanted to wanted to hear what you had to say. And best to those officers. Thanks, Director. Thank you so much. And next up, COVID in the Keys. Monroe County is now imposing new sanctions to stop the spread of COVID-19. County Mayor Heather Carruthers is going to join us live next. This week ended in Monroe County with a record number of COVID-19 cases in the Keys, more than 800 to date. They have been going up that trend line when Monroe, after Monroe County lifted the two check stops, the checkpoints there at the upper part of the Keys that allowed only residents and workers into the county. The Monroe County Commission now is going to impose a new curfew calling for restaurants to close at 11 p.m. Bars have already been ordered shut down there and throughout the state. We want to talk about the situation in the Keys with the Monroe County Mayor, Heather Carruthers. There she is. Mayor Carruthers joins us by Skype from Key West. Madam Mayor, good morning. Good to see good you. Good morning, everyone. So you afternoon have, now. <laughs> all right, afternoon. Uh, so you and the County Commission have set up this new tougher guideline, closing restaurants at 11 o'clock clock stopping the sale of uh, packaged liquor sales uh, from 11 I think to 7 a.m. Uh, mm -hmm. You're going to start that June 24th next mm -hmm. Friday. Why are you waiting to next Friday? Uh, because that's the weekend before mini season when we expect an influx of uh, folks from outside of the county 
Um, and we're trying to do everything that we can to limit the opportunity to gather in groups where one's inhibitions may be down and to uh, help support social distancing. Um, and we think that, that that's, that's where all problems start, frankly. Uh, Mayor, as um, just as this program is on the air, the state releases its new daily numbers. So uh, I, I don't uh, know if you've seen them yet. 859 cases as of this moment in the Keys. Yeah. Uh, certainly that number pales in comparison to Miami-Dade and Broward County, but certainly the population of the Keys pales in comparison as well. And I know that last we talked, you, you really looked to your neighboring counties in the north as the sort of importer of COVID. Is there any thought that those checkpoints will go back up at some point and that the keys will again be closed to anyone who doesn't live or work there? Well, I will tell you this. Um, between March 22nd and, or March 27th, I guess, is when the checkpoint actually went up, and May 31st, we had, through that date, 110, uh, I think, was the number of cases. Um, between May 31st and today, now we're up to 859. Mm -hmm. So that means that we got 749 new cases since we took the checkpoint down. So, so is the thought that the checkpoints might go back up? I think that it's something that we are continuing to evaluate. We would prefer to have the support. Um, we actually need the support of the state if we were going to do that. But frankly, none of this would be necessary if people followed the simple guidelines. And those guidelines are wear a facial covering when you cannot maintain a six foot distance from other people. And every time that you're inside a business or any uh, public establishment that has a roof, maintain social distancing and wash your hands. And what we're seeing is that the people who are coming to visit us are not respecting our restrictions about mask wearing. Mm. And that's why we're in this position. Mm, yeah. If we had a mask or ordinance that was respected uh, from day one, we probably would not be here today. Yeah. Uh, Miracle Brothers, uh, needless to say, the Keys, Key West, uh, I love them. I think it's one of the great places in the world for rust and recreation, for yes. good food, having fun, uh, and of course should obey social distancing, mask wearing, and so forth. But the, the people in the hospitality industry, which drives the economy of the Keys, these folks have just got to be in desperate straits. What are they telling you? A absolutely, you know, it's uh, the, the, the people who have bills to pay um, are very concerned about the possibility that we may shut down. But having said that, if a couple of people inside a restaurant uh, who are employees come down with this, as we have seen happen, the entire establishment has to shut down. So unless people can follow the rules, maintain their distance, wear their facial coverings, we may be forced to, to take more drastic actions, which Believe me, none of us wants to do. I was in the hospitality industry for a long time. I, I owned a small hotel. I know how important it is. Um, and and I, I have friends who are on unemployment now, other, other friends who just can't make enough ends meet. And there's sadly not a significant enough economic safety net for us to be able to get this under control without maintaining some level of economic activity. So the only way to do that safely is to have people respect these regulations and keep your distance and wear a facial covering when you're outside of your home. Yeah, That's really, it's a, a, a bad situation that we are all in together is even more Absolutely. concentrated in Monroe County because of all of that. Mayor, thanks so much. Appreciate your time this Thank morning. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you all very much. Have a good day. You too. All right, coming up, the primary election is just a month away, but the first votes already are being cast by mail. And so we continue our convo with the candidates for Miami-Dade Mayor with Commissioner Steve Bobo when we come right back. On next month's primary election ballot, Miami-Dade voters are going to choose a new county mayor. Carlos Jimenez is on his way out. He is term limited. And four current commissioners are running, and today we continue our series of conversations with them. You've heard from some, and today Steve Bovo is here with us. He has been a Miami-Dade commissioner since 2011, and before that, a state representative for Hialeah. Welcome, Commissioner. Welcome. 
Thank you. Good morning, guys. Good to see you both. Thanks. Same. Uh, Commissioner, I have covered a number of campaign events, heard you, spoken with you about it. And tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me the principal thrust of your campaign is that you would be a better watchdog over county spending. You would eliminate programs that you think waste county money, that, you know, that you're tight-fisted uh, and sensible. Is this really a better management uh, argument you're making? Well, I think it's twofold, uh, Michael. I've seen now for a couple of years as government, uh, local government has been progressively moving to the left, uh, using taxpayer dollars to, to feed a narrative, which is important on social issues, yet getting further and further away from what I believe is the core purpose of why county government is created. You know, I, you and I, we all pay property tax money to have better fire, police services, water and sewer, street repairs. And it seems increasingly that the dialogue in our county seems to be moving further away from that, investing uh, taxpayer dollars in other issues where ultimately then the difference is uh, be between four minutes the police showing up at your home or 20 minutes uh, yeah. showing up if your I, Steve, if I, can, if, if I may interrupt you, give us an example of one of these, you know, liberal left-wing programs that has been funded that has taken money away from essential county services. Well, we, we invest right now $15 million worth of uh, county funds, property tax dollar funds, general funds, into CBOs. So many people may not know, but the county government funds immigration operations, the county government uh, funds education operations. And, you know, we have a school board. We pay taxes to the school board for some of these things. We get involved in areas which I think feed or maybe uh, speak to a loud minority in our, com in our community. And yet uh, the taxpayer who may call our office wanting to get a street repaired or wanting to find out why it took so long for, uh, you know, a police officer or a fire truck to arrive at their home uh, and usually ends up is that it comes down to cost and making sure you're allocating those uh, property tax uh, dollars in the right way. So that said, Commissioner, I mean, this is a nonpartisan race, but clearly in Miami-Dade County, things mm. break down along partisan lines so much. And, and you are clearly the conservative in this race if people had to describe people that way. But, you're, you know, everything now is going to be COVID-related. And sure. you'll be, if you are elected mayor, you'll be inheriting a budget that is severely compromised by COVID costs. So do you, do you see scaling back on, on those kind of safety net social services or, or allocating money to, how do you allocate money in, in a budget mm -hmm. that has been unprecedented? Well, I think first and foremost, what we see uh, in this kind of situation, which is usually, um, uh, you know, when you have a pandemic, when you have a uh, situation where folks, um, you know, has upset the apple cart, I think now is the perfect time to make sure that we reprioritize what county government has, was created to serve. Now is the time to make sure that we're investing our money in the right areas that we should be investing our money in and not uh, try to you know, thin out that dollar as much as possible. Look, Glenna, we are receiving a lot of money from the federal government right now, and we're not going to feel uh, in this budget cycle the pinch as much as we're going to feel it over the next couple of years. And I think this is, this is something that we need to be very careful with. That federal government money, by the way, is something that our children and grandchildren are going to start having to pay the bill, and, and not to mention us in a couple of years. So which but are I those? Think, which are those, commissioners? What, what are those budget priorities as you see them? Well, for me, first and foremost, is safety in our community. So at the top of the priority, I think, is police and fire. You know, I'm not a candidate that will ever entertain the idea of defunding our police uh, department, as many have, or reimagine or reinvent our police department, as many of my opponents have talked about doing. I think fire is one of those issues. Again, you, as, you and I as taxpayers expect certain services. So fire, police, I think at the very top of that list. You know, I look at uh, our uh, water and sewer, garbage pickup. These are fundamental core services that we invest in as taxpayers. And I just want to reprioritize. You know, I don't want to chastise county employees. I don't want to chastise county services. But what I want to do is make sure that what we're providing is done, it's done so in an, uh, an efficient way that the taxpayer could be proud of. Yeah, a Commissioner, in a recent debate with the mayoral candidates, you and Alex Pinellas traded some insults over political corruption. And one of the things that uh, former Mayor Pinellas brought up 
was that you, your campaign, had accepted a $1,000 contribution from David Rivera, the former congressman, a friend of yours, well, a friend of mine, in fact, uh, who uh, had taken a $15 million contract from Pedavesa, essentially from the Maduro regime in Venezuela, uh, and somehow, uh, he says, that tainted you. But you did give the money back, didn't you? Well, first, let me mention that, uh, that as you well know, uh, many folks in our community have uh, relationships with David Rivera. They know him. I returned the thousand dollars immediately as soon as I found out the story because I found it repulsive, quite honestly, that he would engage in that kind of relationship. Uh, but Michael, you know my family. You know the history of my family. To try to somehow insinuate that there could be some sort of Maduro dark money involved in my campaign is an insult to my family. It's an insult to my community. You know, what uh, Mayor, uh, former Mayor Panas fails to mention, he does so consistently, is that since he lied to many of us in our community about the half penny, since the, the, what we remember about Mr. Panos is the era of corruption that he had under his reign, is that today... How, how was it, today, how was it corrupt? Hey, Michael, Michael, how today was it we corrupt? Have dark money, today we have dark money feeding his campaign that he's using to attack me on these kind of innuendos that somehow or another I'm receiving money from Venezuela. It's, it's laughable, and he really should be ashamed of himself for saying these kind of things because he knows better than that, knowing the history of my family, knowing my personal history, as you well know, that we never, ever, I mean, we stand not only against any kind of socialist government, we stand against corrupt governments also. Commissioner, uh, to your point, this race has seen a lot of money invested in a lot of negativity. So um, I want to, in the last minute or so that we have with you, bring it back a little bit to COVID-related policy. You said in, in uh, one of the forums that I saw this week, you said that uh, business owners should not be paying the price. And I wonder if you support or do not uh, the Mayor Jimenez's reclosures of some restaurants and his efforts and what he's doing to try to stem the tide of COVID positives in Miami-Dade right now. Glenda, if I was mayor, I'd do exactly what I've been doing in my district. I'd be collaborating with all the mayors in the community like I've done in my district. I'd be making sure that we open uh, test sites. I'd make sure that we're enforcing the rules. The wearing of the mask is something that we're asking folks to take a personal responsibility. And what I have seen in many businesses, quite honestly, is that they've heeded those requests for personal responsibilities. They've taken the parameters within their businesses to set up safe areas, not just for their employees, but for their customers. I think uh, the, the reaction to immediately start closing business fails to take into account that in many cases, we had demonstrations going on for two and three weeks in our community. There was no social distancing going on there. And also, young people in our community, I think, dropped the, the ball. They, you know, as young people normally are, they feel they're immune to everything. They started congregating and they started yeah. going to house Commissioner, parties. Commissioner, Older I beg you. Commissioner, I beg your uh, yeah. pardon. I apologize. We are out of time. Thank Absolutely. you for coming on our show. We'll see you out on the campaign trail before August 18th. Appreciate the lightning round. We'll see you soon. <laughs> hey, guys, thank you. Take care. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Thanks for being with us. Stay informed, get involved. We'll see you next Sunday. Have a great Sunday.